Hello, Uganda. This is Victoria Wilson Dara inviting you to our second episode of Eye on Uganda. And so on this first show, we're going to do things a little differently because our first guest that was scheduled to be with us on our first show, the late Right Reverend Bishop Misari Kauma, was tragically taken away from us on October 7, 1997, the very day we were scheduled to film our first session for this program. So in this hour, we shall give tribute to one of our greatest religious leaders, the Right Reverend Bishop Misari Kauma, was of all the fiery and effective leaders of our nation, perhaps one of the gentlest, the sweetest, and the most Christ-like. Bishop Kauma preached the word of life and lived by his own teaching. And in this hour, we're going to look at the man who exemplified the best of what is possible. We are going to honor and give tribute to one of Africa's most beautiful children. So please stay with us. Welcome back to this episode of Eye on Uganda. We have entitled this program, A Saint Amongst Us. On October the 7th, 1997, Uganda lost one of its brightest shining stars. Bishop Misari Kauma, described as a small man with a big heart, completed his earthly journey and went on to be with his Lord. Holiness, gentleness, simplicity and sympathy radiated from his presence. Bishop Kauma, also known as the People's Bishop, left a legacy so powerful it had thousands of us spellbound for seven hours in Namirembe Cathedral as we said goodbye to a man whose particular brand of magic was so exceptional it encompassed all of us. Never in the history of Namirembe Cathedral has one man drawn such a crowd to his funeral service. The late Right Reverend Bishop Misari Kauma spoke loud and clear to all of us from beyond the grave. He challenged us all to love with that same encompassing love. It is that challenge we want to examine tonight. So this is not going to be an exhaustive documentary on the man because that would take years to complete. However, in word, song and pictures, 13 of the closest people to the bishop will give us an intimate portrait of the man they called Tata. It all started on August the 15th, 1929, when a little boy called Misairi was born to the late Abiyaza and Besimensi Magala in Nsanji, Mpiji district. First born in a family of 13, Misairi Kauma, or Misai, as his adoring siblings called him, was a gracious boy. His younger sisters and brother remember him as an obedient son to his parents, who loved and took great care of his siblings. He was a very kind man. 
when uh, I was seven, I remember him putting me to bed and uh, even singing those, uh, you know, those songs where the sweet they sing food for little children as they go to sleep. Kale ni tusanyu kanyobo ya janganga awa katu chuu katu saa asanga tu bate ba mtereke devi intu Kwa mwa agaranyo atenga na yatu agaranyo Nzendi mwana wakutano Na yeni nalimu toko gama nga minga baby Na yeni nga vliki ntuchona misaili ampako Bwabali de ampako iranga atu agaranyo Ndi mwana wakuna mfamire Nagendo kuzari wa misaili ya limukuru Nira wagendo kuzara. Ya genda ni mama mtuwa alivu kuzara. Na njagala nyo. Nira ya naza anga. Mkwano kwa ngenyo. Nsanji Primary School. Where the young Misairi spent his first six years of school. The Reverend Wilson Musisi. Headmaster of Nsanji Day and Boarding School. Graciously took us on a tour of the school. Miss Sayeri started out in this building for preschool, then moved on to the bigger school. He started off on one end of the building, moved from one class to another until he finished off the school. Kauma liked this church very, very much. And whenever you are known to on duty, official church duty, he never failed to attend church service in his church. From Sanji Primary School, he spent three years at Makere College School before going to Busoga College, Mwiri. This was perhaps the school that made the biggest impact on the young student. Misayiri wave muhiri na akomaona agama di mnagi. Na loko ka, na hinsi nga mugu za luzungu, tiwa hivyo luzungu, tiye, chino bachita, batiati, chiti nti, chino bachita, ye, nga mwego manyo kubayi zo luzungu. Na hina agati, na loko ka, kwa hijiriza na haka imba, hakati na liyo ka njigiriza haka imba hako. Nti, this is too light of my, nyakuranga kwa chengale, this is too light of my, this is too light of my. I'm going to let it shine, 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 shine. This is the joy light of my life. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine all over Uganda. I'm going to let it shine, 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 shine. Let it shine all over Uganda. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine all over Uganda. Let it shine all over Africa. Kakati, na yenga za makuru kako sigate gira bulonji. Kakati na waga mati, let it shine that bush. No! I'm going to let it shine. Ejo nga jimi sama nyinyo. Put it in that bush. I'm going to let it shine, 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 shine. Put it in that bush. No! I'm going to let it shine, 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 shine. Put it in that bush. No! I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Sanji, the place of his birth, the place the bishop lived with his wife, Geraldine, after he retired from Namirembe Diocese. Here we sat with Mrs. Kauma, and she recounted her life with the bishop. Well, we met in a uh, Christian fellowship. At first, I was uh, uh, at Mengo Primary School, and when I came to the Lord, I started the meeting in a fellowship on Friday at Namirembe. And then also he came to the Lord. So we, we met there. I didn't know. But he told me afterwards that when he saw two girls meeting there, anyway, he thought, said, oh, maybe these two, I mean, uh, these young ones, as we are young also, maybe we'll marry some of these because other people were old. Anyway, that was the first thing. The next thing he told me was when uh, we went to collect um, sweets.
sweet potato leaves with my aunt. And after collecting, it was getting dark. So they gave us two people to take us back. One of them was Misai. And then he was small, but he was lent, I mean, he was given a, a big bicycle. And another one was given somewhere, I mean, a, a bicycle to take my aunt, and then Misai to take me back. So when he was looking for a raised place to stand on, and then I'll sit, I said, no, you just ride, I'll jump on. And I did that. So that was his first impression. <laughs> We started teaching together, we taught Sunday school, we fellowshiped with those who knew the Lord, and we fellowshiped together, sometimes taking us to the fellowship with his bicycle and so on. And then when they knew that Messiah knew the Lord and I knew the Lord, they took, put us on the same duty. Many times you can see our names, Messiah Kauma and Geraldine Subug. So we worked together. And I took him as my brother. And then eventually one and a half years, he proposed to marry me. And I didn't like that because I took him as my brother and I said, this man is my brother, and now he's proposing. How can I change from his sister and then to become a wife? Anyway, eventually, as you, you know, for, uh, people who, 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 who know the Lord, they walk in the light. I walked in the light, but wherever I went, he was already there. <laughs> and then uh, eventually one uh, brother in asked me whether I ever praised the Lord for that. I said, for what? He said, for having someone to, 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 to propose. I said, well, maybe. And then he brought about 10 names of older girls. And he asked me, don't you think that those girls want to marry? I said, maybe. He said, yes, they do, but they don't have someone who proposed them to them at all. Then I started realizing, oh, so that thing can happen like that also. Anyway, after prayers and after walking in the light, and I didn't have any uh, reason why I don't la love, I like him. And then I said, he's not my brother for blood. Then I accepted. and. Uh, there we started preparing and we got married the same year in December 1956, 15th December. I was born in the city of the
na vera bize nyo nyo katutegeke mbaga ye mkono ni tuti imbe mwari wa mchala kutuwa chimba na ye kanisa mchala nalete mwari vina 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 nevye viko kuma ima mchie viko kuma na yobi mwari naga nchie biyari mwari siza nyo mdese mwari vya mwari siza nyo viko ni tuti imbe kanisa mbaga zari zari tano mbaga ni yetu nyo mira nyo 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 iso kuya ya gara nyo kiyoti ya mwagara nyo na atulaga na fendi ya mwagara na fendi tu mwagara bako laga na bulungi tuwali mwumaka nga toi inza kumanya ono yaani mbombinga toi ya ula ogende wano na yogere kintu chechimu no gende wa biso tu na yogere chechimu no mchala na yogere kintu chechimu atenga wano naba tuwa gara chechimu tuwe unyanye kintu echu and then uh, Geraldine his wife was a very kind uh, wife and mother to me because I left my mother when I was so young and I learned most of what I know from Geraldine and Miss I joined the family when, uh, just after I had got married. And we were young, full of life, uh, full of jokes. I remember Miss I running after Geraldine, playing hide and seek. <laughs> uh, they were so loving. Misai Rikauma was a student and a scholar. He was a teacher and a leader. He was a well-studied man of deep thought. A man who found his deepest satisfaction in quiet prayer and contemplation. Though we had prayers in the morning together, but he kept his be being aside himself with the Lord to pray and read the Bible. So I think that one helped him very much to, to know the Lord more and to walk with him straight. Just after we, we came together, when we were courting, he told me that he wanted to become a clergyman. And for I didn't like it. I said no. And I feared three things. Poverty, visitors, and moving around place to place. So I said no. Anyway, it, he kept quiet and he was praying about it all the time. Every year since then, it came back and he was telling ab uh, about it, telling me about it. And then for me, I said no, 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 all those years. Until it was 1961 when we got our third child, Ruth. Then it came back again and he told me again. And then I started realizing if this man is not called, it wouldn't have come back every year. So I started praying about it. And then I realized I'm the one who is hindering his ambition to become a clergyman. So I repented and told him one night that I accepted. Now, if you are still wanting to become a clergyman, I'm free. Whatever will come, let's go. Misai Rikauma had an opportunity to study for the priesthood at many fine institutions, including Buwalasi Theological College, Bishop Taka Theological College in Mukono, and Durham University in England. But even though he took all his roles seriously, he took his roles as a husband and father as his first priority. We had seven children. But the sixth child died at childbirth, and she was our second girl. And our first son died in 1950, I mean, 94. Yeah. And that was David. Yeah, that was David. <laughs> 
I have tears in my eyes as I write these words because I'm not despairing, because I look forward to a joyful reunion with Tata in heaven. I thank God that he gave me a father who was loving, caring, and humble. He was also a loving husband to my mother. Now as my father, that was even a, a very special relationship because I was his only daughter. And I think I knew that and he knew that. So he was very, very close to me and, and uh, took a lot of, of counsel from me, which, which is not very usual for fathers to do that. But he used to ask me about how he was dressed, whether it was okay. And I'd say, yeah, you are fine, you look good. Or um, how did I speak? And I would say that was a good speech or you didn't say the right thing or you shouldn't have said the other. That closeness, I think, even when I got married, was still there. Together with my husband, he loved us and our children. And Tata was very loving to all of us. One thing I always remember, I mean, there was, um, there was no distinguishing between us because um, we were all equally loved. For example, when he wanted to call somebody, he would say, De Mo Eno, and then say Stephen, you see? Hmm? All, all of us were equal in his, in his eyes. So he would, he would first go through all the five names and then finally come down to, to the person he's actually calling. That was the love he had for us. And it would make us feel proud that we, we have parents who love each other so much. And on top of that, you know, apart from loving each other, they would share that love that they had for each other with us. So that we would never feel left out, that they love each other too much and don't have time for us. No, it was never like that. They always had time for each other, and they always had time for us as well. So we considered that a, a blessing, really, a really great blessing. Um, he was he was an exceptional husband, I should say. He was so loving to my mom. I don't know if there's a, if there's ever been a better husband. He was he was really caring. Um, the love between them was exceptional. They were so they were made for each other, you could say. Um, I don't know. You know, normally in relationships there are ups and downs, but these two were <laughs> it was like they were born together, you know, made for each other. And not only was he a good husband, he was the best father there ever could be. He was the best. We grew up with him, you know, he was very caring, very loving. You'd tell him whatever you wanted to tell him, and he would give you the answer, whatever problem you had. All you had to do was tell him, and you'd find your solution, just like that. He was so loving. That's one thing I miss about him. So. I started being at the bishop's home at a very early age. 
I think it was around three years of age when my father was killed and I was left to my mother who was a sister to the bishop. And uh, when my dad was killed, my mom rang the bishop when he, he was not yet a bishop then, he was a reverend. And my mom tells me, the bishop said that, Kristen, we are coming. And since then they came. The best decision that they took was that it was not, my mom had nowhere to go. So they took me, that is me, Emmanuel and Kristen, to be in their home. And since the age of three, I have been with him. And when I look at him, I look at him as my uncle, but he's more my father than my uncle. Because I even called him Tata, and he would say, Mutaban. And that's very interesting. Uh, talking about the bishop, or Tata, as we fondly knew him, is a little bit hard at this moment. It amazes me that I can actually talk about him now because during the time when he was still alive, it was very hard to imagine him dead. But now that he's dead, we have to fondly recall all the memories and all the beautiful times we had with him. Um, as a father, my father died when I was, I think, two years, uh, one and a half years old, and um, he was murdered, and the bishop became my father. And I have so many things I recall about him. Uh, growing up as his son, as I should call it, he was always a, an example to me as I grew up. And all the virtues and values that he told me, I strove to emulate them. Bishop Kama was an uncle to me and also a loving father because my father died when I was three months old and he took, he took us on, me and my two brothers and made us his own children. He, he made us call him Tata instead of uncle. And, and everything he did for his children, he also did for us. I remember, th I remember three particular times when, 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 I, when someone queried why I called him Tata. And, and one was his secretary, she was called Nora. So I'd taken break for him. And, and she asked him why I called him Tata, and he said, she's my daughter. Well, I'm her Koja, but she can as well call me Tata because I'm her father. He was, um, he was a very hardworking man such that he, he always wanted you to be able to work at his pace. Those days when Sanji was still being set up, every evening when you go to, um, 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 when you'd get there to visit him, he'd say, hey, I'm going to Sanji, will you escort him? Then you'd know that you will work the whole, the whole evening until you can hardly walk. And, and the problem, I, I mean, a fact about him is that he rarely got tired. He would, uh, carry this, dig this, lift this, do that. Seemingly not, not getting tired. That was one thing about, uh, about Muse. But he really taught us how to work. I think I can, I can do a lot of things right now. I can, I can work to the maximum. That's one attribute I got from him. A couple of weeks after the funeral, I visited Nsanji, and Mrs. Kauma kindly took me on a tour of their farm. The bishop had been very proud of his farm, and even on the last day of his life, he made sure the chickens had feed before he retired for the evening. Sanji is approximately 12 miles on the Kampala Masaka Road. On the four-acre farm, they not only have livestock, which includes poultry, a duck, a cow, and a couple of dogs, but they have an extensive garden full of pineapples, matoke, gonja, ntuntunu, pawpaws, passion fruit, and also local vegetables like buyindi yindi, dodo, nakati, katunkuma, mushrooms. They also have tomatoes, beans, maize, and sugarcane. He was ordained 
in December 64 to become a deacon. And then he was posted to Namirembe Cathedral as a curate. And he worked uh, under, I think, uh, Reverend Y. Bale. He was the vicar, but he was the curate at the cathedral. And his work mainly was to go to the schools around the cathedral. So he worked very much with the schools at that time, that year. So that year, 60, no, that year, that 65, that 65. Then in September, he was chosen to go and study in Durham University in England for three years. He went there and then he started for two, he studied for two years and then uh, I went, I joined him in the third year. So when we came back in 60, no, 68, then he was posted to provincial office as deputy provincial secretary. But his work was for refugee secretary, I mean, uh, he was a refugee secretary in the provincial office. So he worked with refugees from Rwanda, from Sudan, and many others. So he helped them so much, uh, take them to school, buying things for them, and so on, and so pressing them in uh, different, I mean, for accommodation, and so on. And then in 97, he was uh, seconded by the Church of Uganda to go to work as refugee secretary for Africa with AACC. That's all Africa Conference of Churches. And there, he worked there for three years. And uh, Anyway, when he was working there, he traveled so much in different areas in uh, Africa and outside Africa. So he was al always on safari. And then uh, when he was there, he was called back to Uganda to become a principal for Bishop Taka Theological College. And then he started working there in 1973 so that was uh, when he started working there in his third year then he was chosen to be uh, an assistant bishop I mean that's uh, for, for, for Bishop Dan Stan in Suvuga for Namirembe Diocese so that he's in his last year in Bishop Taka, he worked as a, as principal and as bishop for Namirembe Diocese for six months until he was again moved to, to Namirembe. And then he worked with Bishop Nsubuga for about nine years because since 75 to 85 in February, when he was consecrated, oh, I mean, enthroned as the diocesan bishop of Namirembe. And then from there, he worked up to 1994, when he became 65 years of age. Then he retired. Bishop Kauma was a man of prestige. He was not afraid of hard work and was a man of courage and determination which gave him audience with some of the most powerful men and women of the world. He counseled presidents and crowned kings. Yet he loved the unlovable with the truest love this century is likely to see. Then he had an amazing influence on people. You'd be moving around with him, then you'd see him touching people that maybe you in yourself would never touch, you know? He would touch people who are sick and things, and he would comfort them in a way that you, you could never imagine. Uh, the, the things that, as a human being, maybe you can't imagine. He had that power of God, I think, on him, and he liked helping people. I think that's mainly because also his, 
his background, he's had a lot of, we've, we've, we, we have, he had a lot of suffering. So he knew what suffering people felt like. Because he knew the Lord when he was young, then he took, I think the collect, I can say, the collect of Jesus. <laughs> Sorry to say that, but I've been seeing him with as if you see Jesus when he's described in the Bible. Because Bishop Misaikama has been a very humble man, a very loving man, very hardworking, and very, anyway, forgiving, and many other things. Mm. And as I kept growing, he kind of changed what he was telling me to kind of prepare me to be a person who loves people because the bishop really loved people. If he's driving or walking, he would always wave to anyone he sees. Let it be a kid, an old lady, and sometimes he would even stop. And if you're sitting in the car, you would say, But he would always stop at least and say something. And I believe Auntie Jeldon kind of gave him a lot of encouragement. Bishop Kauma came into his own when he stood in a pulpit or behind a microphone anywhere around the world challenging humanity to love and to act responsibly towards one another. We have more so this year realized that many more people are dying of AIDS than we had expected. Almost daily, I hear of somebody, even today, they've already come and kubikat to me, told me, <laughs> of two people who have died of AIDS. And I was, just before I came here, somebody came into my room and said, have you heard? So and so that so and so son has died. It's in a six. I said, what is it? What is it? He said, he's died of AIDS. So I don't realize that there's more AIDS than many of us had realized in our country and then all over the world. I was in America last year and their AIDS also is growing. But here it is concentrated, as you know, because of the war and bad living that we had during the civil wars. We are more, we are more uh, best having AIDS than we should have been perhaps before. And so we realized there's a great need for we as locally to take responsibility of our sick. It's high time has come to stop looking for, to Europe, America, and Germany to collect the money for us to come and treat our AIDS patients here. Because in America, very soon, they are going to have enough trouble from AIDS to want to spend the money on their own people there, in Germany and in England. Because wherever, whoever comes tells you the problem is growing. So we've encouraged every parish every congregation to begin to do some work on the patients around their area and also to care for the orphaned children around them. Um, at the moment, from this center, we are supporting or trying to support 200 orphaned children. You've seen the little chick girl who held the box for you to cut and open the center, that girl was and is an orphan. And many like that. We've got 200, and that's the number we could afford to look after. That's how far our money could go, and we don't know whether there'll be money for next term. But we could have had thousands, but we can't take on everybody. So we are encouraging local people, everybody everywhere, to take responsibility for uh, aid sick, because we cannot afford to pay no attention because uh, at, in the church they retire when they are 65 so he worked for that I think uh, before for about two years before his retirement because of building his house uh, working on his gardens preparing for what for retirement so when he became 65 he was telling me all the time, and I was telling him, we have to retire, retire. When we are 65, 
we have to retire. And we worked for that. So we, we, when he retired, we came here and we started working on our gardens. So when he was asked to become a chairman of the Uganda AIDS Commission, anyway, it was a surprise for us, but he accepted it because before that he worked for, for that thing. In Namirembe Diocese, he wrote a pamphlet about uh, I mean, uh, HIV, AIDS, and uh, he brought Bongore Rutaya in the church to see that people n try to know about HV, HIV and AIDS. So he has been telling people in his preaching about AIDS and so on and so on. And he prayed for many people and he visited uh, people who, are, who had the HIV AIDS and those who lost their loved ones through that. So he had to accept and he, he, he accepted he accepted it and he started working. It was, it was quite a sad moment when I lost my brother David. And you know, it was even for the bishop you know, I'd never seen him cry before. I saw him cry for the first time and it really touched me. You know, after that, he really got involved in this AIDS work. And this inspired some of us even. I personally got involved in AIDS work at school and so on. So David's death really changed the family a lot. Uh, we are arguing that everybody in Uganda should become a supporter of an orphan children. Maybe in your own home, on the surroundings. It's high time we share the little money we have with those whose parents have died. It's high time that each one of us should learn to be a nurse. Because you can never have enough nurses or hospitals to look after eight sick. Very soon, almost in every home, there'll be somebody dying of AIDS. So this center is going out of its way to teach ordinary people how to care for the sick people. Also, counseling is a very necessary work, and we are trying to teach our people all as is possible to become counselors, because in every home, there's going to be somebody who's been deeply hurt in mind of the loss of the loved one. So we all need to learn to be counsel and, and lighten the burden of our sick people. Um, in response to this challenge, Your Excellency, last year I took off three months of sabbatical leave in America. And most of my time I spent writing a book about how to cope with this age scourge and uh, also how to be helped if you've lost or you are expecting to lose someone. And in those three months, I managed to complete the book. I've got a complete manuscript there, which your excellency, I'll show you. And I'm looking for the publisher. If anyone knows who can help me publish, please let me know. Because At the beginning, he didn't, want, he didn't want to talk about condom at all. And many people, when they were talking about condom, he didn't like it at all. And then, afterwards, he started telling the people, if you are stupid, hmm, don't be foolish not to use a condom. That was his word. He talked about it so many, many times. But I think there was a program in Jinja. They didn't understand him. And they said, now Bishop has accepted to use the condom. No, he didn't say that. And when uh, people uh, started telling him that, oh, you have now you, you, have, you have accepted the condoms, he said, I didn't say, say that. I said, anyway, in his, his right sentence, he said, I said, if you are stupid, don't be foolish not to use condom. <laughs> I think many people would know him more as a bishop, but for some of us, 
he was just a father, even for me as a son, on, uh, as a son-in-law. I really don't think I related to him as much as a father-in-law, so much as I related to him as simply a father. And the friendship was that kind of thing, because that's how he related. It's true. I remember when we were prepared, planning for our wedding with Ruth, and uh, we didn't bother too much about whether we had a Mercedes-Benz or we had what kind of car. And he offered his own Mercedes at the time, which he had, UWX 330. I remember it very well. And he said, you'll use that one. I'll come in a pickup or whatever, you know. Uh, and he was dead serious. I mean, he would say it more or less jokingly, but he was actually dead serious about it, that if you had no car, he would give it, because that was him. He would just give it. Uh -huh. Mze, as, as we call him, was very funny sometimes. And I think I remember him putting on funny attire. You know, on the last night, we, the last night we, we were with him, he came out from the bedroom wearing a shirt and a very short tie, a blue shirt and a, a, a red tie. And we all said, how, how can you do that? And he said, well, all my ties have been taken by your brothers. So I can't find any, you know, he never used to put on ties often. And then one time we went to the botanical gardens and he had this huge hat on his head and he, he kept it on all the time, you know, that was him. The bishop was naughty at times. <laughs> I remember him, you know, once we are sitting in the, uh, we are in the sitting room uh, with the children and, and the wife, Jildin, and uh, <laughs> He came out of the bedroom in Geraldine's dress. <laughs> and it took us completely by surprise. Oh, there was a lot of fun. That brought us a lot of fun and laughter. <laughs> you see, um, one thing um, I'd like to talk about is Daddy's hobby. He was a photographer, this thing, you know. He always used to walk around with his camera. He was, um, he was a bishop, you know. So normally, You'd expect him to sit at the high table, all, all grand and so on. But after some time, you'd see him walking around, taking snaps here, taking snaps there. And some of them are very nice photographs. Um, I can say, um, on my wedding day, some of the best snaps I have were taken by Mze. Though I had, two, um, I had two professional photographers there, but the best snaps I had were taken by Mze, who was supposed to be sitting at the high table like the father of the group. But he, that was daddy. He It is my hope and my deepest prayer that the bishop's message has inspired us all to that level of love and commitment to humanity. This has been our show for this week. My name is Victoria wilson Dara, and I would like to ask you to join me here next week on the same station at the same time. And until then, just remember, we are keeping our eye on you. Why, yeah.